Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy Ja, your host, and I have Adam Brewer here as my co-host. I know we promised you an episode on conditional access, and we will get to that. But this week, there was some news in the cybersecurity world that we wanted to get to and help you mitigate if this is still an issue in your company. So a few weeks ago in the news, there was a cyber attack in Germany in a hospital in Dusseldorf. This was part of their university hospital, and they were hit with ransomware. And because of this ransomware at the hospital, their systems shut down, and the hospital had to turn away patients and reroute them to other hospitals. There was a woman who had a life-threatening condition that was sent to a hospital 20 miles away and actually died from the treatment delays due to this rerouting of traffic. What was really interesting about this ransomware attack, which kind of mirrors COVID, is that the hospital wasn't actually the target of ransomware. The university was. And then due to the network being connected to the hospital, it flowed over and started affecting the hospital. So I just found that very interesting because in modern cyber warfare, just like a virus in the real world, it has no borders. It takes no sides. If you're connected to the internet, you're a target. And why this is relevant and why Adam and I wanted to talk about this topic this week is that this happened again to Universal Health Services, which is a Fortune 500 hospital and health services provider. And they have over 400 healthcare facilities in the U.S. and the U.K. They serve approximately 3 to 5 million patients each year. They're a Fortune 500 corporation. And they were hit with ransomware this week. I started seeing on Twitter reports of hospital staff reporting that there was chaos, that computers were shutting down, patients were getting relocated to other hospitals, all communication had to be conducted through paper and courier, and they had no access to any lab equipment, radiology studies, EKGs, all of that was shut down. So ransomware is still a thing today. All of this combined prompted us to make this an episode so that you can make sure that your company is protected from these attacks. Before we start, we want to have a conversation about the mindset of security at a company. Adam, you had mentioned during the MFA episode that MFA is a mitigation to the risk because passwords are a poor method of security. You know, I think that's a good place to start where security, in essence, is risk mitigation that all security analysts and defenders, they do a risk analysis based on the vulnerabilities that are there. And they have to balance that with, you know, not only user experience, company funding, and also the expertise that they have employed at that company. And not every company has the funding available to purchase the tools that are necessary. When we get into this conversation, we're going to talk about a lot of different tools. And not every security professional has the expertise to run the tools or to deploy them. Not everything that we're going to talk about is within your control. Sometimes you have to engage other teams like the sysadmins to do patching or the network team to do network segmentation or the desktops teams to make sure the configuration of the workstations are correct. But you should try to control what you can and influence the decision makers. I think that's a really good point about influencing decision makers. And this is where I'm going to offer a bit of advice that you might think sounds out of place in a security or blue hat podcast. And that is that the most important skill you can develop as a security professional or skills plural are communication skills, the ability to write effectively and be persuasive the ability to go speak in front of senior leadership and articulate to them the risk and why you need to make a change that may have negative user impact or why you need the funding to purchase a particular product. I am not a security defender myself. I don't do that. I'm in technical sales. So what I get to do every day is I talk to tons of information security professionals across all sorts of different organizations 
And what I can tell you is that a skill that I most commonly see lacking across that environment is the ability to be persuasive and bring people to the cause. Security professionals as a whole, and I'm painting with a broad brush here, and I apologize if if somebody feels individually victimized here, I'm not trying to single anyone out, do a really good job at understanding the technology and understanding the risks. But sometimes where the challenges are is getting senior leadership to buy into those risks, to understand them, and want to invest in mitigating them. And that's where all the way up the food chain, sometimes even up to chief information security officers, they're not really good at helping people understand that. And that is such a tremendous skill. If you can't win funding, if you can't win willingness to implement changes, if you can't do all of those things you need to do, and Like Andy even mentioned, persuading other technical folks like the desktop team or like the network team. If you can't be persuasive to your cause, then you won't be effective as a security defender. So what I suggest is spend time learning how to become a better writer. There are all sorts of resources on the internet to learn how to become a better writer. There's all sorts of books about becoming a better writer. If you can write a really good email, that's going to help, especially right now when you might not be in front of people as much. But when we do get to go back in front of people, go do Toastmasters at your organization or at a nearby organization and practice giving persuasive public speeches. And you know what you could even do in the interim until we're all back together in person? Why not start some sort of lunch and learn or some sort of educational video series inside of your organization? If you're on any sort of Microsoft licensing for Microsoft 365, You own a a technology called Microsoft Stream, which is like an internal YouTube for your organization. Everybody's got a webcam right now. Everybody's got a headset right now. Record a video. Record your screen. Explain some sort of obtuse technological concept to your organization in a friendly and accessible way. And use that opportunity to get better at educating others in your organization on what it is you do and bringing them to understand your side of whatever defensive mechanism you're talking about that day. And these are skills that you can carry with you forever and will benefit your career more than any certification, more than any technical skill, more than ownership of any product. Communication will take you farther than anything else. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Communication as a security defender is definitely one of the top skills. When you're doing your risk analysis, some risks are greater than others. We talked about in a previous episode, MFA. So if you have a cloud identity, MFA is a high risk, high probability vulnerability that you have. And so that's something that you need to mitigate right now. And we're going to go through a whole list of different things. And you're going to have to try to prioritize which ones they are. We're going to try to help you through those. But not everything is an emergency. Some of these are nice to haves. Some of them are must haves. And as a security defender, you need to be able to articulate the risk the consequences of that in plain terms so that whoever you're communicating it to, your CISO, your CIO, your CEO, so that they understand because there is a high burnout rate in this industry. And I believe that is from just the stress in general of carrying this responsibility of worrying about whether or not your defenses are working, whether or not the things that you're doing matter. I'm here to tell you that if you're one of the security defenders that aren't actually making the decision, it's not your job to accept that risk. The risk should be accepted at the executive level, and your job is to articulate what would happen if this risk isn't mitigated, and their job is to accept it or pay to mitigate it. I often use, when I try to explain this concept, the home security example. So I have a lot of friends who live in the country, and a lot of them, they don't lock their doors at night, or they don't lock their cars. And that's because it's a very low risk and low probability that their house is going to get broken into or their car is going to get broken into. But if it does happen, they've accepted that risk of it happening. They knew it was a possibility when they left the door unlocked. And so they've already accepted that risk. If I were to live in the city, I would lock my doors. I maybe would have a deadbolt. I would maybe have a camera system to try to mitigate all the different risks of that environment. At some point, your security mitigation or tools or products can be a little bit too much, could be overkill. If I were to have a retinal scan and a laser wire in order to get into my house and four deadbolts, you know, that's probably a bit much depending on what type of risk I'm actually trying to mitigate. 
Maybe you have the knock list in your house. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. From Mission Impossible, right? Mm-hmm. And at some point, the user experience starts to become so terrible that it's unusable if they have to leap through all of these things in order to just get to working. That puts it in really excellent terms, understanding the ownership of the risk assessment and who accepts that risk, because generally as a information security defender, it's not you. So understanding that you don't need to carry that burden, you don't need to live with that is a really important point that you made, Andy. And I think, again, ties in nicely to my point about communication skills is that the most important thing you can do is articulate it accurately and fairly. And then if somebody else accepts it, you have to have that short-term memory of forgetting that and moving on. Exactly. So let's start into the actionable things that you can do to protect yourself and your company from ransomware. And we're going to break this up into three different major categories. There's a prevention so all the tools and mitigation steps that you can take before you're attacked. There's detection, which is your ongoing analyzing of your tools and alerts to see when there's an actual attack. And then there's your recovery. Because if there's one thing that you can take as a security defender is it's not a matter of if you're going to get compromised, but a matter of when. Assume breach at all times. Assume compromise. It will most likely happen at some point. So recovery is a very important step to have that laid out that when an attack happens, what are you going to do to get back to operational status? So the first thing we want to talk about in the prevention category is endpoint protection. This space is so saturated over the years with third-party solutions. And I've demoed, I've deployed, I've used many of them that are out there, both on a personal level and from an enterprise standpoint. I mean, you can name them off, right? Silence, Forcepoint, Cisco Amp, Symantec, McAfee, Trend Micro, CrowdStrike, Carbon Black. I mean, there's so many that are out there. And that is a result of the evolution of Windows, where Windows 7 was made with productivity in mind and not necessarily security. Windows 10 is by far the most secure version of Windows, and it was built with security in mind. And at some point, we're going to do a deep dive on security features within Windows. But for the purpose of this conversation, I want to talk about the endpoint protection that's built into Windows, which is Windows Defender, I believe, if that's still the name of it, Adam. I know that they did some name changes during Ignite. Yeah, Microsoft Defender for endpoint or Microsoft Defender antivirus, depending on if you're talking about the component or the whole suite, would be the name now as of the Ignite conference, what, two weeks ago now in, in late September. But I, I want to stop before we talk about names and, and specific products and, and add on one more point that you made to how the evolution of Windows and how that has affected endpoint protection platforms. So the other thing to consider is that Windows 7 was released under the kind of old school life cycle where it was released and it had five years of mainstream support and five years of extended support. So organizations could know that they had 10 years from the date of launch to run Windows 7. And Windows 10, of course, operates under this Windows as a service model where there are today two releases a year, a spring update and a fall update. And for everyone, the spring updates are supported for 18 months. And the fall releases, if you have enterprise or educational licensing, are supported for 30 months. So there is no option short of one we're not going to talk about because it's not relevant to today, the long-term servicing channel, where you can sit on a single version of Windows for an extended period of time. The longest you can sit on one is two and a half years and be supported. And that's, of course, assuming you install it day and date with launch, which if you're an enterprise, you're probably not doing. So it is important that your endpoint protection platform keeps up with this rate of change. And so many of these vendors came of age during the time frame when Windows was released and you could run it for 10 years. And so that's, I think, another very major data point that has affected how we approach endpoint protection platforms. We mentioned in the beginning that there's always a balance between usability, funding, and expertise. And when it comes to funding, a lot of these third-party solutions can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And as you're adding on different tools, each one of these tools costs hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. 
Microsoft Defender for Endpoint is built into Windows and comes with your Windows licensing. So it's essentially included. There's no additional cost to have to pay for Windows Defender for Endpoint. And modern AVs, they're so integrated into the operating system. Any one of these third parties, as, uh, along with Windows Defender, have very sensitive access to the operating system. A lot of them have hooks into the kernel. They have privileges to see all executables, network traffic. And so one of the things that is a real concern is what happens if your AV vendor gets compromised? And there was an inkling of this a few years back when it was reported that Kaspersky, which is owned by a Russian company, AV agent that a lot of enterprises use, was actually using their AV agent to conduct enterprise espionage because they had this type of access into the endpoint. And so you have to think about that when you're picking a vendor and looking at the privileges that these AV products have into your operating system. A few years back, Microsoft knew that this is a vulnerability. If the AV agent becomes compromised, the attacker can have root level privileges or escalated privileges within the operating system to do whatever they wanted. And so a few years back, Microsoft announced that Windows Defender for Endpoint can run in a sandbox, which is a game changer if you ask me. Sandbox escapes are one of the most difficult things a hacker can try to do. The sandbox itself takes all of those interpretation signals and keeps them within the sandbox so that if the agent itself gets compromised, it's in the sandbox. When you think of everything we're talking about with regards to risk and managing risk and mitigating risk, one of the things we're trying to do is not make it impossible for attackers to do something, although that's great if we can, but we're trying to make it expensive for attackers to do. And, and expense doesn't necessarily mean money, but time. And when you introduce something like that, like the sandboxing of Microsoft Defender Antivirus, where you have made it so unattractive as a method to try to compromise, short of like state-funded attacks or very, very targeted specific attacks, that's probably just not going to be a direction an attacker is going to want to pursue. They're going to try to go through some sort of easier route, like a compromise driver or something else. It's just make, made it really unattractive versus with the other antivirus providers that have this very sensitive level of access and, and are not sandboxed, they still remain extremely attractive. It's the same concept as someone who's walking down a parking lot and checking the doors. If it's locked, they're just going to move on to the next one. And if they find a door that's open, they're going to burglarize that vehicle, right? It's already easier in the fact that one door, one hurdle isn't there. Right. You had mentioned earlier in the conversation, Adam, that a lot of the third-party AV products run under this old system where they expected the operating system to be supported for a very long time. And with Windows 10 as a service, that 30-month support model, every time Windows comes out with a feature update, I've experienced, at least from my end, where the AV agent that you may be using, if you're using a third-party agent, may not be ready or compatible with the next version of Windows my AV agent is actually preventing me from upgrading to the next version of Windows and holding me back. I saw this in my past life in IT. I, I literally experienced this with Symantec Endpoint Protection. We had wanted to roll out a new feature update for Windows 10, and we were prevented from doing so by the security team because they were married to SEP, and SEP did not support this new feature update. And it blocked us from installing it for many, many months and of course, that had downstream and negative implications. And what do you think that does from a building a relationship between security and the rest of the organization perspective? It definitely didn't help. It, it was another kind of wedge between us. And if they had used another solution that would not be blocking updates and preventing another team from accomplishing their projects on their timeline... It just creates a better all-around experience, not to mention just from an overall security posture perspective, not installing a feature update in a timely fashion is kind of counterproductive. Like you're holding it back so you can update your antivirus provider, but now you can't install a feature update, which may have a whole bunch of security enhancements. And in the case of Windows 10, feature updates usually does. And you're also losing time off those 30 months of support. 
the later that you're installing that feature update, if it releases in May and you don't get it installed or deployed on your workstations for six months, I mean, you've already burned six months of support. And we should point out too that we keep you keep quoting the 30 months. That's only if you own Windows Enterprise licensing, which to be fair, a lot of organizations do, but not 100% of them. If, if you're just rolling with the professional that came pre-installed with your OEM hardware, you've got 18 months. The other thing that has also happened to me in the past is a third-party AV product has been actually using a vulnerability that was patched by a Windows security patch or a feature update. They quote unquote, Microsoft quote-unquote fixed it. And so when we updated, the AV agent actually stopped working because the hook that the AV agent was using was actually a vulnerability. And so that, to me, again, all of these things kind of lay out you know, the cost, the ability to run in the sandbox, the integration with Windows 10, the agent gets updated uh, with security updates and feature updates. That all, to me, lays out a very clear path that Windows Defender Endpoint is probably the easiest solution to go with. Although if people want to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a third-party security product, I'm not going to tell them no. I think, again, we've talked about this, having something in place is better than having nothing. So if you want to spend $200,000, $300,000 on a third-party solution and spend the time and energy to update that agent and support that product, I'm not going to tell you no, but I think all the things that we've laid out, in my opinion at least, and I'm pretty sure you agree with me, Adam, is Windows Defender is by far your most cost-effective and easily supported product for endpoint protection. Funding is a zero-sum game. You only have a finite amount of money in your organization. And so if I'm running a security organization spending money on something that has all of these downsides to it and at best is going to deliver me comparable protection to another solution that costs less or nothing doesn't seem like an effective use of my money, especially when that could be spent on another tool that is going to provide significant additional protection. I think we've laid out a really challenging case to justify spending that money on another provider. And I would even make one more argument. We get really myopic when we talk about Windows, and especially everything we talk about on this podcast is, of course, going to be enterprise-focused. But there are still an enormous footprint of Windows PCs that are in people's homes. And I don't know about you, but I don't know a lot of people who are running CrowdStrike at home, or Carbon Black at home, or Cisco AMP at home, or Forcepoint at home. I could go on and on. You have these great providers, and they still have very good products, and I'm not speaking negatively of them. However, whenever we get myopic and lose lose sight of the big picture, it, it can be damaging to our security efforts. And the fact is, attackers still attack consumers. Consumers are not invulnerable. Consumers are still a really important part of the overall security picture. And to be frank, especially now Symantec spun off their consumer offering as well. That's a totally different organization. There's very few, if any, enterprise endpoint protection platforms that also have a consumer play. So they have a huge blind spot in terms of threat intelligence and telemetry and visibility into those endpoints. And there's still a lot of them out there. So I would argue, and you'll, you'll hear stories about this, where Microsoft Defender antivirus will block at first sight a new zero-day attack, and that could be at a small business somewhere. That could be at a person's home somewhere. And that still gets integrated into the overall protection of the product and disseminated to all of the endpoints very, very quickly. We're talking seconds, if not minutes here. And that is a blind spot that every other provider has. And then you even consider, again, you know, kind of making a strong play here, but it's just important to think about how all these pieces fit together. You can use telemetry from things like email protection platforms to enhance an endpoint protection platform. Because if I see a new threat come in through email, I can certainly take the hash of that file and block it at first sight from my endpoint protection platform. How many of these endpoint protection platforms have a play in email? Okay, Cisco, sure. But a lot of the others... Not really. CrowdStrike doesn't get in that space, you know? And so there's another kind of bonus for the Microsoft platform is that it has that telemetry, that intelligence baked into the product as well. 
And I guess to my last point, and and this again, let's step back and, and make this a broader point for information security professionals, having that growth mindset, having that ability to relook at your assumptions and challenge your own assumptions and learn new things is really, really important. And I understand that Microsoft had a spotty history in the past with regards to security. And I don't think you'll find anybody who would challenge that assessment. However, today, Microsoft spends over a billion dollars annually in research and development. They have over 3,500 security professionals. They're in all sorts of aspects of the security game. And so maybe you have an axe to grind against them because of something they did five or 10 years ago. And you could argue a lot of people have turned over since then. But today, if you take a fresh set of eyes on the situation and make the best evaluation for your organization, in a lot of cases, rolling with Microsoft Defender Antivirus is is probably going to be a good choice for your endpoint protection platform. And that's, again, requires you to, to challenge your own assumptions in a lot of cases, because I know there's a lot of hard feelings there with a lot of information security professionals. And I'm not saying it's not deserved. But times change, people change, companies change. And certainly, if we're not evaluating based on the current information, then we need to do that. I know, being an information security defender, that we have very strong opinions about things. And sometimes that's hard to change. I've talked to a lot of people, and I certainly think I'm right all the time. And they think they're right all the time. And so when you say having that growth mindset, I think it's very important that this industry is changing on a daily basis. And so are the tools and so are the companies. I mean, how many times have you seen one company acquire another security company? They're getting merged all the time. And what's new today is old hat the next day. And so Microsoft, I think, has really emerged as a security vendor they have a valid platform and they are integrating all of their things. And we can have an entire conversation about the best in suite versus best in category, best in breed. That was a huge conversation at Gartner a few weeks back when I attended their security conference where security folks are now all working at home and having to check multiple consoles and multiple tools that don't talk to each other can get very tedious and you start to miss different signals because the alerts don't correlate with each other. I may get a malicious file in an email and that gets blocked, but that doesn't necessarily talk to my endpoint protection because it's a different product. I may get a user who reports a malicious email. For me at my company right now, that is a different product than my email protection. If someone reports an email being phishing, that threat intelligence doesn't actually flow over to my email protection. I have to manually go and search for that email in our email protection. And while I can do that, you know, that's a manual process. And then I have to evaluate that email. If it is malicious, I have to retract that email from the system. And that's all manual. And that all takes time. Whereas I think there's a better way of doing it in an automated fashion. Attackers don't think in terms of siloed product solutions. They think in terms of attack phases. I should clarify that I have received the Certified Ethical Hacker certification, and so I've been through some really in-depth training as far as that process of gaining access to a system, taking whatever you're looking to take or, or executing whatever you're planning to execute, and then trying to cover your tracks and get back out. Attackers aren't going to think in terms of, well, you know, their email protection platform can see me here, but if I you know, do this, now I've switched over to their endpoint protection platform. They don't think in terms of of that. Obviously, they're aware of what detection systems you might have, sure, but they're not going to execute their attack in a way that's going to align to these neat siloed products, even if they're all best of, you know, best of breed. They're going to do what they need to do to accomplish their task. And when you have all of these siloed solutions that, again, can be great products at their individual area of focus. But as you're trying to follow that attack across the kill chain, you're going to have gaps in visibility as you pivot from one dashboard to another, especially when maybe the timestamps are slightly off, maybe the way they present the data is slightly disjointed. It's going to be really challenging. And that just becomes really problematic because attackers, of course, are going to come in generally through email or a malicious attachment or or link or whatever, or phishing attack. And then they follow a pretty standard playbook on gaining their initial foothold, moving laterally, gaining privilege escalation, starting to lay all the foundation for their attack, doing additional reconnaissance, 
executing the attack, covering the tracks, blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, the point is that having all these disparate solutions, they can all be great at protecting or detecting in their individual areas of focus. But man, if it's hard for you to pivot from different attack vectors, you're going to have a really hard time in following that attack end to end. And dumping everything in a sim is not the magic solution. You can go ask Target about that. You know, there's a many, many examples where organizations too often, and, and I'll get off my soapbox in a second, but they treat their sim as a log dump. They dump all their alerts into their sim, and then they can't kind of pull out and see the actual attack as it's being perpetrated. So Target is the canonical example they were compromised. They had set, sent all of the necessary logs to their SIM, but they didn't have anything that was pulling them out and making them visible. And so that's just another way where you, even if you say, well, we'll use our SIM to bring everything together so we have that you know single pane of glass, it doesn't necessarily work out if you don't have the intelligence and the automation to alert you to the most important, most pressing needs at hand. And it's just uh, it just kind of making that point here to consider as you evaluate solutions and platforms that having individual solutions that are all great Probably you won't get fired for doing that. But ultimately, if you're trying to be the most effective with your money and your time, it probably isn't that. It's a good way to spend a lot of money and hire a lot of headcount because you need experts in all the different tools. But I don't know if that's the best way to actually protect your organization. To kind of wrap up this whole endpoint protection, you should have one, certainly. And I think our argument is instead of spending money on this very important piece of mitigation, spend it somewhere else because there's going to be other tools that we talk about that are going to be more important. So that's a good stopping point for today. I think we had a great conversation about the overall mindset of risk mitigation, risk evaluation, and some of the skills of security professional, soft skills, you might call them, that have no relation to technology, but can help make you more effective at your job and to protect your organization more. We had a great discussion on endpoint protection. We went through the very crowded space this is and talked about the different solutions and some of the challenges they have with staying up to date with Windows 10's updating model or some of the ways they gain access to the system and do the protection. There are just so many things when it comes to ransomware protection that we need to talk about. But Adam and I wanted to spend some time specifically on endpoint protection because we believe it is the first layer of your defense and by selecting the right product, and we won't always recommend a product, but by selecting Microsoft Defender, we believe you can save a lot of money and manpower when it comes to maintaining and deploying endpoint protection. Next week, we'll dive into some more techniques and mitigations that you can do to protect your organization from ransomware. Thanks for listening. See you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.